Uh, it's almost good afternoon. I think we're <laughs> still in good morning. Five minutes. <laughs> right, so uh, this session is um, on Asia sustainable development and um, we've got um, a very diverse panel here. Um, the purpose of this session is to actually talk about how uh, markets in Asia can actually produce um, more uh, benefits for more Asian citizens um, and how we can actually meet our environmental uh, constraints in Asia and also our resource constraints. So um, in order to kick off the discussion, I thought um, I would just sort of point out two uh, kind of big trends which uh, seem to be working at odds with each other. The first is that um, a lot of people have noticed that Asia is so-called leading the, leading the green revolution in, ter in, in terms of when you look at this, the amount of spending that um, is going into green technology and new technology and smart tech, actually Asia is far ahead of the pack in terms of percentage of GDP. So you may have heard figures like uh, Korea's, you know, 80% uh, of its stimulus program as a result of uh, the global financial crisis was actually in green technology and China is actually devoting more and more percentage of its GDP to um, green tech and the level of spending that is going on towards urbanization, uh, new technologies in China in, in, in terms of infrastructure is actually pretty phenomenal. Um, and a lot of that's being done in the Pearl River Delta. And there's a lot of new policy incentives and, uh, and environmental uh, regulations that are being put into Asia to actually move the region farther along towards a green economy. But at the same time, um, a lot of Asian governments are very worried about um, you know, global rebalancing and they're trying to rebalance their uh, economies towards consumption. They're trying to grow the middle class, grow Asian consumption, um, and as we all know, consumption is actually one of the, uh, one of the problems with uh, us running up against our global environmental constraints. So the, <clears throat> the big challenge here is actually how do, how do, we, how do we balance these two, these two models in that we want a greener economy and we want one that is actually more socially just, but all we have to work with is actually our old model of uh, consumption, a consumption-driven economy. Um, so, in order to uh, in order to reconcile these uh, these 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 two big trends, um, we've got a panel here, and uh, our panel is very distinguished. Um, we're going to start with um, Lord Nicholas Stern, who um, everybody sort of probably knows. Is you, you, I mean, you were the former economist of the World Bank, one of the first major economists to actually come out and say that uh, climate change uh, is something we should be spending on today in order to avert. And so we'll start with you and then turn to Dr. Supachai um, and Sheree. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, and I very much share the way you've expressed um, the introduction in terms of the focus of uh, Asia uh, on these issues. And if you're close to half the world's population and more than half the world's growth, then uh, Asian issues are global issues and global issues are Asian issues to sheer force of uh, the sheer weight of the numbers. But let me start with uh, some fairly brutal arithmetic on emissions and climate change and then say something about policies and finance. I'll, I'll try to do that very rapidly. But the arithmetic really matters and it often gets lost uh, in, um, in the discussion. Uh, the world is emitting close to 50 billion tons CO2 equivalent of uh, greenhouse gases annually. If we're to have even a 50-50 chance of holding to two degrees centigrade above the 19th century in terms of global surface average temperature, even a 50-50 chance of two degrees, we have to take that 50 now well below 35, 20 years from now, and well below 20 billion tons 40 years from now. Those numbers are crucial. 50 now, 35 say in, 90, in 2030, and below 20 in 2050. The, uh, that's absolute decline. If you uh, ask then, well, let's hope the world's uh, income multiplies by a factor of around three in those next 40 years, then you've got to do an absolute reduction of a factor of two and a half, You've got output growing by three, so emissions per unit of output have got to come down by three multiplied by two and a half by a factor of seven and a half. Now, there's no precision here. A 
factor of seven or eight or something like that. That surely is an industrial revolution. Changing your energy efficiency, changing your source of energy, stopping deforestation, but if you just look at the energy side, that's an energy industrial revolution. It's a transformation if you're dividing emissions per unit of output by a factor of eight. So that arithmetic is basic and it tells us, takes us straight to uh, the right concept of all this, which is a, a great wave of technological change. If you look at the numbers for the individual countries, China is now about 9 billion tons of CO2 equivalent of that nearly 50 in the world. China, if you take the 12th five-year plan, and there's particular numbers that uh, Yu Ming Kang presented yesterday, which I commented on, China will be, go from 9 to 12 in this next decade. If China peaks, as uh, Liu Ming-Kang described, is the current sort of picture, in 2030, that means China would probably peak about 15 billion tons, one five. Remember I said that the overall budget for any chance of two degrees, and even 50-50 chance, for the world was below 35. If China's 15, there's no way the world is gonna be below 35 in 2030. We just have to recognize the arithmetic. And bearing in mind, China is trying very hard. So this is a measure of the, uh, the challenge that we face. We can't sort of potter along and, because delay is very dangerous. This is a ratchet effect, the concentrations build up, and we lock in high carbon infrastructure. So those two reasons mean that delay is dangerous. So that's a measure of the challenge. Now, the cheerful part of the story is that industrial revolutions are very exciting periods. They lead to lots of uh, discovery. And where we're trying to go is cleaner, quieter, safer, more energy secure, more energy efficient, more biodiverse, much more attractive. So it's a very attractive story that we're trying to create, but we're going much too slowly. What are the policies we need to get there? Well, we're going to hear, I'm sure, lots of uh, discussion on that. A price for greenhouse gases is clearly a part of that, a fundamental part of that. But there's much more to the story. Policies on R&D, policies on networks, policies on capital markets. These are all areas where markets fail in important ways and where government policy is going to be very important. So greenhouse gas price is fundamental. But it's got to be much more than that in the way that uh, I described. And policy has to be clear and credible. One of the things we've suffered from in Europe is fits and starts. I mean, one thing the United States has suffered from is probably not starts, but it all depends where you look. You know, that I haven't got time to go into the detail, but if you look at California and the US Navy, then the picture looks much better than if you just look at policies in uh, DC. Um, but I've described the range of policies that count. It must be the greenhouse gases, but please, we make a fundamental mistake if we stop there. R&D, networks, grids, public transport, and so on. Uh, capital markets are fundamentally important. So clear and credible policies covering the range that I described. And finally, the importance of finance. And if the policies are clear and credible, then we do see the private sector looking ahead. It's a future focused entirely on hydrocarbons is clearly not credible. And no sensible industry would put its money there. But it does need uh, clear and credible policies to give the confidence to go the low carbon route. Sometimes that confidence can come from the right kind of financial backing. We're, we're getting a green investment bank off the ground in the UK. I worked in the EBRD as chief economist, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for six years. The presence of the right kind of development bank in a project or program can help with reducing policy risk. Companies that could have bought the EBRD, the EBRD invested in Central and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, companies which could have bought the EBRD nevertheless wanted the EBRD partnership because it reduced policy risk. That's one reason why I think this idea of the BRICS-led bank, which was given strong support in the BRICS summit in February in Delhi, I think is so important. I've been involved in helping with the ideas for that. 
And that's an example where the presence of a development bank can reduce risk. The BNDS in Brazil is another example where the presence of a development bank can reduce risk. So this is the idea where you've got a development bank partnering with, the finance, with private sector finance, which will give the big bulk of the resources. But the presence of a development bank, I think, can be very valuable. But uh, if you put together clarity on policies, some participation by the right kind of uh, development bank, then it seems to me that uh, private investment will be leading the charge. And if you look back over any past industrial revolution, it has to be private investment that leads the charge. Thank you, uh, Lord Stern. Um, you, you said that Europe has a lot of fits and starts, and let me assure you that actually in Asia we have those too. So um, I'd, I'd like to turn to Dr. Subachai, um, who um, uh, probably also needs no introduction. You're a uh, former Deputy Prime Minister um, and Minister of Commerce of Thailand, and then you've uh, contributed to formation of APEC, former uh, Director General of the WTO, now in your second term um, at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, should be happening in terms of policy and in terms of the political uh, uh, arena, both at the global level and uh, local levels, especially um, as you see them here in Asia? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Pam. Uh, I would like to uh, build up my argument by first uh, making some points about the way we need uh, to change the paradigm of uh, our development concept so that we can, we can handle the issues of sustainability right. Because if we don't change this paradigm, we'll be stuck uh, with a sort of market-based policies that uh, every time government steps in, there will be some kind of intervention that we don't need. Or if uh, we want to do some good regulatory, smart regulatory framework, it's not done in the right manner. So I would like to, to give you, paint a picture that we need to do some change in our mindset. Secondly, uh, I want to discuss a little bit on how some of these conceptual frameworks uh, could be translated into terms of policy action. Because we don't need only theoretical concepts. We need to have practical policies that could be implemented and could be assessed uh, all the time. And thirdly, I would say a little bit about the, uh, the inconsistency, particularly in Asia, uh, the way uh, we try to, to marry uh, democracy, democracy with a way that we should guide uh, our next generation of, uh, of, of, of development uh, cooperation and development programs uh, in, a, in a strategic way that we can engage in, in changes. Now, the first one on... Uh, on on, on perceptions, uh, all the time, uh, and, and now uh, you can see as we move uh, to our next uh, UN meeting on sustainability at uh, Rio plus 20, uh, a couple of weeks from now in, in June in, in, in Brazil, we are now having a very intensive debate in New York and in Geneva on how we can deal with putting the so-called green economy concept into practice. Green economy. Does green mean all the trees and forests and all this other thing? No. For us, green economy means inclusive development. It means inclusive development. And for us, green economy should mean that we need multilateral solution to what Nick just said. We can do things a lot on our, in our region, in Asia, individually in countries, but the real solution must be first the global solution. So for the green economy to take effect, it must have the backup of multilateral support. For example, in the areas that we'll be looking at uh, uh, how to set up a sort of, a, a sort of green fund to be able to make use of the fund so that countries that would need to come to grip with their poverty issues can at the same time make use of additional funds, not only to do their policy right with the poverty reduction, but at the same time to be using the new ways and the low-hanging fruits 
to link it with a poverty reduction, like what they do in, in India to have villages being involved in the renewable energies by having women every day coming with their lanterns who have a charge using solar cell. Uh, these are the, the low-hanging things, uh, uh, low-hanging technology that could be used, at the same time to deal with poverty and also to deal with, 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 with the technology that we need to, to adopt to, to, to guarantee clean and carbon neutral or low carbon development. We need also uh, to be able to understand that in order to have this green fund, I think Nick has been saying something about investment. From our side at Angtat, we believe that, uh, as again, uh, Nick has been saying for many years, this is, this is a whole industrial revolution in itself. This is just like industrial revolutions in the 19th century. It's just like the, uh, the revolution of the IT in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 21st century. This is a whole new cycles of investment. This is a Chumpeterian long cycles. So from this, we must be uh, able to adopt the kind of investment policies or FDI, foreign direct investment policies, that could link investment with what we call at the UN, we call it sustainable investment. So at the moment, we are putting up together with different institutions around the world, including the World Bank and the uh, FAO and the UN system, to see how sustainable development, sustainable investment uh, could be quantified in terms of, uh, of, of policies. So countries, when they do, and you know there are now more than 6,000 international investment agreements, IIAs, and more than 6,000 bilateral in IIAs. And, and just a few of them, most of them will be actually emphasizing on the rights of the investors and the rights of the host countries and things like that, but very little on the implications of FDIs on sustainability. So countries are now trying to put that in and we have our own sets of principles so that they can adopt that kind of policies. We are now also working uh, to change, to so-called change the mindset or, or to try to work with the entrepreneurs in the private sector by doing something along the line of the uh, uh, the so-called, what they call, um, let, let me have a look here, uh, the, the, e, the ESG, the Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance. We do this uh, together with a group of uh, so-called sustainable stock exchanges around the world. We have created a forum for sustainable stock exchanges, and then now half of the, all, the whole world stock exchanges that are in this forum with us to be looking at the, the standard practices in linking stock exchanges activities with sustainable economic development. In one area, we've been working on the standard of reporting, sustainability reporting on carbon footprints, on how much they are doing to be able to, to promote certain green economies in, in certain areas. We also are asking all these participating stock exchanges, sustainable stock exchanges, to adopt the kind of listing requirement involving also the record of carbon footprints of the newly listed companies. And, and, and in Asia, there are a number of, of stock exchanges in Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, they're all parts of this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this forum, and we are trying to expand this to cover the whole world. So this is an area in which we are trying to bring in the private sector to be involved in this new concept that you have to link nearly everything in everyday life with, with this kind of, a, uh, of, of, of new uh, set of criteria. Now the second part uh, is in the area of turning all this into, 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 into policies and, and to have the policies make, make us understand this. This is, this is the part that has uh, created for us at the UN uh, the, the greatest uh, difficulties because we understand that the uh, political life cycle is very short. What we're talking is about long-term involvement uh, to get on the sustainabil sustainability bandwagon. And policies, uh, policy makers, politicians come and go. So you would see in many countries, when one of the, one of the standard recommendations is to tax fossil fuel much more than in the past, to levy heavy taxes on fossil fuel, and to give subsidies to, uh, to renewable production. Now, if you look around in the world, and you look around in Asia particularly, the greatest concern is that Although there has been some efforts to tax, to allow the prices of fossil fuels to go up, it's not always easy. It can have the effects of actually 
a failing government. Governments can really uh, uh, go into crisis if they go against, they said, so-called the will of the people who have cheaper sources of energy. So in many places around the world, I was just talking to my colleague from Indonesia and also my uh, colleagues from the uh, uh, Minister Marie Pengistu in Bangkok when I was attending the World Economic Forum in Bangkok. They, she was telling me about Indonesian government efforts to introduce new bill into the, into the parliament some weeks ago uh, to, to raise the price of oil. And it was defeated in the parliament. Same thing as my own government, the government of my own country in Thailand. The first thing they came in as a government, they came and they said, look, we're going to do away with the oil fund. And uh, we're not going to collect any, any, any uh, fees for the oil fund. We're going to uh, use all this oil fund money to stabilize and to reduce the prices of oil. At this what a time that the oil prices are, are declining. So what we are seeing at the moment is that politicians are just behaving in an opposite way on the contrary to what we are saying. And they are not really subsidizing renewables very much. You, you see renewable production only exception of, of China maybe, but the rest of, of, of Asia, I don't see much work being done in trying to help to promote in some areas, maybe yes, but the way that the, the, the complexities of the tax regime is still very much counterproductive uh, to allow renewable uh, uh, energy companies to, to go up. So the, the change of the mindset, not only in the way we work with business, but in the way what we practice, the long-term developmental strategies that would have to be understood, have to be taken up in the national strategies and, and, and maintained and implemented consistently by, by the politician. This is really an uphill task, and I do think if the Fung Institute could also help to bring in more policy makers, more politicians to be involved with us, not only among ourselves to be listening to academics and business, we are all sold to the ideas already. But there are a huge number of politicians in Asia that they may have heard of all the things, but they would say this is, you know, charities begins at home in my constituency, I don't get elected if I go for higher taxation. I keep telling them that you know, the tax effort in Asia is very small. To do social protection in Asia is not to go and announce that I'm going to cover this as a universal coverage for health and everything, because you can't do it. Because the tax coverage is not there. So you have to start by telling the people that I'm going to tax you more so that you can have a better care in, in education, in health, and everything. Now, the, the, the last point uh, I would like to end up is the, in, in the areas of international practices. We're going to Rio plus 20. And in New York at the moment, they cannot agree on anything at the moment. Uh, the outcome document uh, for, for, uh, for Rio Plus 20 is still very much in the doldrums and looks very bleak. When we are talking like this in Asia, I think, yes, we can look this uh, through the Asian lens and see what the Asians can do, but this is a globalized village. I don't think what we do in Asia would meet with really the kind of echoing without really the participation of the rest of the world, and particularly uh, our colleagues from the advanced economies. And so going, going to Rio plus 20, and I can just cite one example, and then I will end in trade, uh, Pamela. In the areas of trade, there are countries these days who are trying to adopt the right policies to promote renewable uh, uh, energy production. But there are so many trade conflicts being presented to the WTO at the moment at the dispute settlement uh, body in the areas of what is happening with the taxation regime, subsidy regime, what concerns renewables. Uh, with Canada, with China, many with China, with Brazil, there are so many countries that are now being taken to task to the WTO because there is a lack of clarity between the trade rules and the, and the environmental rules. So I hope that uh, with Rio plus 20, if we come out of that meeting, not with an agreement. I don't think we can ever have an agreement on how to reconcile the trade rules and the, and the climate rules overnight because it has taken us 10 years and we are not yet seeing the end of the lights for the uh, Doha development agenda. But Antar is proposing at Rio plus 20 that we should create a green economy forum wherein all these matters concerning multilateral trade and multilateral climate change policy, climate policies, should be, should be taken up by this forum, not for negotiations. But just to sort out what are the priorities, which areas? Is it green mileage? Uh, is, it, is it the kind of uh, the, the processing, uh, the, the production processes that cannot be handled by the WTO at the moment because the WTO only handles the border uh, trade, not, not inside the border. 
So we have to take the, uh, the, 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 the inside the border kind of issues up, uh, up front. Carbon taxes, can we handle that, that at the border? Can we also handle the kind of transition from, uh, from, from, from normal uh, development uh, uh, strategy into, into low carbon development strategies by, by keeping the rate of economic expansion uh, uh, in a healthy manner? We need some, some adjustment here, some, some funds. We need to be able to make use of the CDM, the, 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 the traditional clean development mechanism that used to be part of the, the old regime coming from Kyoto that has not been fully used by the countries, but really used by a few major European countries. How can we make that a more multilateral deal so that the CDM can be applied by everyone so that when we get on the bandwagon to have a new round of investment uh, 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 cycles, that this can be used to support the kind of uh, sustainable investment that we would like to see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subachai. So you've outlined a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of uh, big challenges for global policy and as well for local politicians who do one thing and say another. Um, Shuri, uh, turning to you, you, you are running one of um, uh, the world's biggest tire manufacturers, active in both Indonesia and China. And um, even in an adverse policy environment, what, um, what do you think business should be doing? What has been your own experience? And um, how can business sort of be an active agent of change, even um, when global policy isn't moving or when national policy is, is not moving? Thank you. Is this better? Uh, maybe just yes, speak up a bit. Speak uh -huh. okay. I think if you just um, start. Uh, if, um. All right. Um, thank you, Pamela. And uh, I'm very honored to see you and um, if not General Supachai, who I guess represent the government as well as the local society. And from the business um, perspective, um, I think uh, your question on making market work for the millions, I do believe that uh, markets uh, work for the millions, but we are in a situation, ask the question, does market work for the billions? We have reached uh, 7 billion people. Um, and, and I think uh, Dr. Spitzer has said we need a paradigm shift on the development model, on the market model. And as to whether businesses uh, should, should uh, take responsibility, um, I think in Chinese there's a belief that we should look at ourselves first. And I fully believe businesses have to take responsibility. And um, I think there has been some encouragement. Uh, it's encouraging sort of developments uh, after sort of the various crises led by a lot of the academic institutions. I think um, Michael Porter has talked about um, the need to look at shared value. So instead of just looking at just shareholder um, uh, profits as the only sort of uh, rough sort of objectives that companies should also look at the shared value. It's actually a win-win approach where um, in, uh, there have been very interesting examples. And you said all profits are not made equal. And uh, I think, I mean, our, we have been through the 97, 98 financial crisis. Indonesia has been quite hard hit. Our family has also suffered through that. We have learned lessons. Countries, jobs, development can go backward a long time with a crisis like that. And um, I think banks, I think recently there's been a lot of blame on banks. And I think, um, you know, that products being sold that they don't understand and spreading the risk and... Uh, but I think we need banks, we need big banks. We cannot just demonize um, you know, the situation. They also support the real sector. But how can Asia, Asian finance system, financial sector and banks, and also the framework learn from this 
so that, uh, you know, or, or we help the, these uh, institutions to have a, a sort of, it's kind of like a create new products. If in order to do shared value, we can look at some of the products may not, uh, may be sort of uh, more, more toxic, so to speak, than other products. You know, the, and there could be uh, support on how to withdraw from, it's kind of a withdrawal from, you know, the, maybe the casino type of incentives, um, uh, incomes. There can be other incomes. And I want to bring some hope, one hopeful example, because um, I think Dean Allen White from MIT is here, and we work with MIT on the program has been, we started uh, maybe more than 10 years ago, a foundation, education foundation, United in Diversity. And our thinking, that was after the Indonesian crisis. And our thinking was that, you know, there's no, we, we, we need to move forward. And I think Dean White, I remember very well on the phone call, he was on a camel back in, in Egypt. And he was saying, oh, Shari, you know, a big conference talking about the inclusive approach with leaders and tri-sectors, business, government, civil society, uh, talking about moving forward is not going to change anything. But we need to build the future leaders the future tri-sector leaders. So we started and we, we actually searched for it and in, we had, um, uh, uh, we were very fortunate because uh, Otto Sharma and Peter Senge um, have developed this new program, a leadership program that engages all three sectors and it's very well thought out. Um, and uh, we sent, we have sent now, uh, close to 100 uh, leaders from business, government, civil society. And one of them I brought to Tsinghua University two days ago to speak to Tsinghua because we have just started the program um, in China. And he is the, uh, he's at the helm of BNI, which is a state bank in Indonesia, the oldest state bank. And she used this methodology, which I, it takes too long to explain, but Basically, she explained one of the outcomes, and she is one of just, you know, the many positive outcomes from each of these fellows. And she explained how she transformed the whole bank, where, you know, in the past, they don't have to even think of customer, customers come to them, but she had to change the mindset. Started with 100 senior executives, then 1,000 middle, middle managers, and now they were coming up, engaging with the civil society, and coming up with products which would actually uh, may help those who are non-bankable become bankable. And, and they become very, and she said the bad debt and the, in, the lucrative uh, part of it is actually better than the big business. So, so I, I asked her to send me um, her criteria, which en involves the environment, the cultural, the, it is really shared value, I think. Uh, and I, uh, I also want to raise an example of the tri-sector approach uh, is Walmart because um, we're very, uh, you know, my, uh, we invited a uh, chairman of Walmart, Rob Walton, who, you know, in the early days, and he, I think they're celebrating their 50th um, anniversary and I saw, you know, some investors were sort of some disgruntled, but from what we know of the family and, and uh, Rob Walton, I think he has done so much for the environment. And he, he, the way it started was Conservation International. Again, you know, innovation and breakthrough paradigm needs um, you to go out of your usual realm and get across sectors. And the Civil uh, Conservation International sort of got together with Rob Walton. And it's a very interesting story how it all started, but they, you know, through several dives and meetings, they started to, started to realize what Walmart could do, and he also invited uh, his senior management, and my husband is on, on the same board, so they went together, um, at that time was Lee Scott to China, and look at all the supply chain, all the innovation and, and energy uh, savings, and, and I think, you know, they have done a lot more, or uh, they, I think businesses can do so much if they are willing to to take on this responsibility.
And I think there are many other research. Tarun Khanna has written on uh, billions of entrepreneurs. So not only do we need to help big institutions, banks, or businesses think about shared value, but you know, billions of entrepreneurs, because we have to think about the inequity issue. And, and Professor Kaplan has, has also prepared something to make it implementable down to the balance scorecard. So I think there is, there is hope, and I fully think that it's, I'm very, um, I always feel very touched when I see statesmen instead of politicians, you know, and, and how we need the same process for politicians, for civil society, and then the, I think we will be closer to sustainable development for Asia and the world. Thank you, Shuri. I think you, uh, you actually hit on um, a very important point, which is um, what does it take to get us out of our business as usual? What does it take to actually drive the level of investment that um, Professor Stern has actually referred to? And so um, what I'd like to do is actually uh, say, given the scale of the challenge, what, um, and given, this, given the, uh, you know, the likelihood, as Dr. Supachai pointed out, that we're not gonna get a globally comprehensive deal on sustainable development at the global policy level, but what are the one or two major policy actions, specific, that could, um, that could be done and which would actually drive business and incentivize business to get out of business as usual, to start making more investments into the green economy, to start making more investments into renewable technologies and renewable energy. Um, so I'd like to hear uh, one or two sort of policy, focused policy suggestions, and then I'd actually like to turn to the audience because I see several major investors and investing companies in the audience like CLP and like Dow um, and like Joe Ferrigno um, and Jose. And so I'd like to actually hear from you, you know, what, what do you want uh, global government and pol policy makers to actually do which would actually allow you, give you the freedom to actually break out of business as usual and uh, start you know, playing your part in moving toward the green economy. So to you, Lord Stern and Dr. Subachai, and then uh, prepare yourselves to be called on. <laughs> when you think about policy on this, the most important lesson at the beginning is that there's no um, slam dunk or hole in one or however you like to silver bullet, however you like to describe it. Uh, you do need clarity on price and regulation of emissions of greenhouse gases. And governments can do that. They can start, as uh, my friend Superchai said, uh, by stopping subsidizing the things that are doing the damage, which are hydrocarbons. And there are hundreds of billions of subsidies on hydrocarbons. So stop doing that. Start taxing coal. And that's beginning in both China and India, but it's got uh, a long way to go. Um, and support for R&D. I could go on, but you asked me to limit. But those are ways, concrete ways, where the intention of governments would be signaled in a clear and strong way. I've mentioned finance, I won't uh, repeat that, but I do think involvement of development banks in this process is a, another way of signaling long-term commitment. There'd only ever be a fraction of the money, but their presence uh, does matter. And if you put those together with the power of the example that uh, Sherry was talking about, um, you, what you want is the policies, and those policies to be clear, but you want also to show that people really can do this and are doing this, that it's not just some construct or const theoretical const construct or a new perspective. It's more than that. There are ways of doing it that really make a difference. And there's so many examples now already in advances of uh, energy efficiency. You've got the Walmart example. And it's not just Walmart. I'm mean, Sherry was starting with that, but it is actually a good example because they've grappled not only with themselves, but also with the whole supply chain. Clarity of policies, help with finance, good examples. Okay, 
Dr. Supachai, yes. one or two policy mm. um, yes. recommendations. Mm. Could, could I uh, compliment to what uh, Lick just said first on, on finance? I think it is, of uh, course, uh, finance will not solve everything, but uh, I think we really need to succeed in setting up the so-called Global Green Fund, as has been committed by most countries from Copenhagen meeting. And this is not a big deal, and uh, Nick has been talking about how to, how to uh, strengthen the role of the de development banks, and this is something that we have proposed uh, to the UN system, UNFCCC, and the negotiations going on. Another area which you may not like it so much, but uh, this is, I think, w th that's why I talked about paradigm change and mindset. People don't like to be taxed, but we believe that uh, in order to get cheap finance or budgetary financing to help poor countries to get on the bandwagon of green economy, we, they, they need to have some supplementary financing grants, not, uh, not loans. So one area that uh, we used to discuss and, and, and talk about, but it's not very widely at the moment accepted as consensus, is, is, to, is to tax uh, financial transaction. Uh, it will be a, a, a very minuscule rate but of course, in principle, financiers, bankers do not want to be taxed seemingly, and I would agree. But as you look into the situation of the world at the moment, there is, there is very little way except by just, uh, we're doing this capitalization of the Ormond Bank, but to tax 0.001% on the financial transactions, uh, uh, we would have billions of, of dollars to be able to put up as a global green fund that could emulate what CDM used to be doing is to in introduce uh, low carbon investment uh, to something like the mechanism of the clean development mechanism. This is one area. Second area, and I will stop at that, is in, in, in technology. And we haven't discussed enough on technology because at my institution at Ankhart, uh, much as we would like to see as us trying to promote partnerships for development around the world, there's still a lot of uh, trust deficit among the North and the South. I mean, this is just it's true. But what, what we are trying to say here is that we need to have transfer of technology. And the, te the technologies are available. And they're not always very expensive. They're low-hanging. But we need to have some urges, some support, some facilities from the governments. But the governments, particularly from the, from the developed country sides, keep telling me that they don't own the technologies. Although I know that they subsidize, they support technologies and research. Uh, processes a lot. I don't need to have free transfer technology. I need technology to be transferred in a more simple manner uh, for the poor countries. Sometimes for free, yes, uh, like open platform for the, uh, for the uh, internet, uh, for, for the I ICT uh, processes. But here, we have proposed something which is very concrete, which is the, the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement, the TRIPS. As you know that a few years ago, at WTO, we have amended the TRIPS to be able to allow certain exemptions so that some pandemics like HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis could be better assisted because we allow parallel importing, compulsory licensing. It makes things cheaper, accessible. We have proposed the same thing, same exercise that we have done on TRIPS uh, for, excessive, uh, um, for pandemics, uh, for essential medicines, to be also uh, uh, performed uh, for, the, uh, for the climate area. So to have exemptions so that some of this technology could be transferred or could be reverse engineered in a way that people can learn more quickly and so that they could get on the bandwagon. Because otherwise, even with the funding, if there is no transfer of technology, they have to wait a long, long time. Unless China has become so advanced that they can turn around and say, OK, we have developed this much technology. We can turn around and help the rest of the South. But this is not going to happen. I think we need really and coming out of your plus 20, besides funding, besides the uh, institutional change of UNEP, UN Environment uh, Program, uh, besides so many things, we need, we need green fund, we need technology uh, uh, transfer that could be much and much more facilitated in the past. Thank you. So um, uh, those two, and then added to the ones by uh, Mr. Stern, stopping subsidies, start tax coal, and to have more involvement of uh, the development banks. Um, so can we have some reactions from the audience? Do you, um, what do you think? Mike? Uh, I'm 
Michael Edisis. I, uh, I have a, a question specifically for Dr. Stern, uh, because the, you, you uh, seem to concede, and I think most people concede, that, the, uh, that uh, the level of emissions that will continue will not keep the, um, the um, uh, climate, uh, the, the, the progress of climate change out of the danger zone. And it's been suggested that uh, the most uh, dangerous, um, uh, uh, the, the greatest danger is from uh, the possibility of extreme scenarios, even, even, if, even if unlikely. Um, and the, the, um, you probably know the, the economist, uh, Marty Weitzman, has suggested that what we need then is uh, quote unquote fast ge geoengineering preparedness. To, to get ready some, some geoengineering projects that can be uh, launched very quickly if it looks like something is, we're, we're getting some runaway uh, climate change. Even if it's unlikely, it could happen. I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about uh, that uh, uh, idea. I should say I've interacted a lot with uh, Marty Weitzman over the past uh, 40 years about lots of things. Um, and uh, his emphasis uh, on uncertainty and risk is an emphasis that I absolutely share, and we both talk about that. But the first remark is that um, we don't have to miss this one. Um, if you ask me to bet whether we will miss the kind of targets that I've described, I fear that it's quite likely that we will. But we don't have to. And so the first part of the response is that if we really accelerate and take this problem seriously, we can embark on a different path which is far more attractive than the path we're on. So I don't want to sort of start with the assumption that we're lost on this because by far the best outcome is to uh, embark on the industrial revolution that I'm just describing. Do we need to think about geoengineering? Uh, sadly, we do. But the two huge changes. If we try to stop the energy coming in by tossing um, dirt into the atmosphere in some shape or form, we probably can stop the energy coming in. But that leaves the CO2 there. That uh, means that the oceans will continue to get uh, acidified. And of course, there are all kinds of other things that might happen that we don't know about. So whilst we need to know a lot more about geoengineering, we know enough to recognize it as likely to be extremely dangerous. So yes, we should continue trying to understand it a lot better. There's a good Royal Society report in the UK on uh, exactly that. But we, whilst we do it, we should recognize that it's probably extremely dangerous. And the much less dangerous path is to embark on the kinds of directions that we were describing. There are other comments? Yeah? Um, yeah, Nicholas? Pamela. Uh, Pat Dawson with oh. Dow Chemical. Uh, we, uh, we consume a lot of energy, and I think uh, there's, there's been a, a lot of good recommendations made up here. I think some you have to be careful about, but the two that I think are most obvious, uh, one around energy efficiency, that's um, talked about a lot, but I think governments uh, and the private sector could work a lot more together in changing some of the building codes, regulations, and by the way, not just buildings, the third largest consumer of energy is appliances. And so uh, how you give incentive, not subsidy, but how you give incentive to business to come up with more energy efficient materials pays huge dividends. Our company's invested about $1 billion in the last 15 years in energy efficiency and we've gotten a return of $9 billion. And that's documented in our shareholder uh, statements. So $1 billion investment, $9 billion in return on just saving energy, not putting all the, the dirt, the, dirt the, the carbon up in the atmosphere, right? I think the other point is around R&D incentive. We have 600 scientists in China right now, and we've got them focused. 25% of the projects that we're working on in China is directed around energy efficiency, energy storage, how you connect wind into the 
grid in China, how we work with the China government on that connectivity through our electronic materials technology, uh, through our uh, other technology that's used in transmission, more efficient transmission of power. So I think the R&D side of this has to be done in conjunction with the efficiency side of it. One word of caution on a carbon tax. I think you have to make sure that while the intent is good, you have to be careful that you don't let that become a source of revenue for the government in terms of how they use that as opposed to the intent of a carbon tax. So I think that's a tricky uh, issue. Intention is good, but let's not have the governments think that uh, they're going to make money from this as opposed to using that to incentivize the technology, the efficiency, and these types of things. Thank you. I think um, we, we have a couple more comments from the audience, and then um, we'll, 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 we'll do a collective response. So Jeremy and then uh, Nicholas Salmo-Smith. Yeah, Jeremy Hobbins from Lee and Fung. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your comments. Um, without going through a whole list of what we're doing at Lee and Fung, let me just say that, that uh, we're extremely focused, particularly with our vendor base. We use 15,000 factories around the world to help in the manufacturing process. And I accept that there's a huge job to be done in, in upgrading the standards in many of those places, and we're working actively on that. But I want to turn to another part of the equation here, and I particularly wanted to ask Lord Stern for his views on this. Um, the elephant in the room on this subject is the expansion of the population of planet Earth. You could say that, that, that human beings have really overrun, to the detriment of all other species, the population here. Now, I, I know you're a man of many talents, and I don't expect you to single-handedly be able to control the future population, but <laughs> what are your thoughts on how planet Earth, is it, on, on, on population growth, does business have any responsibility to try and help with, with controlling the population? Do we have any right to have any, any influence on this? You, this subject must have come up, I presume, during your, your, your vast experience in this, so I'm just interested in that. And I want to link that with one particular business issue, and that is that um, can business live without growth? If we assume at some stage populations will plateau, if we look at Japan, for example, and there are other examples, if we look a few years ahead in China, how does business live without growth? And not just growth in population, but growth in the appetite of the populations as people move up the, move up the, the, the value chain and, and instead of planting rice, they're driving Ferraris, to, to use a very obvious euphemism. Your comments on that, uh, please. Let's take uh, the comment from... Uh, uh, Nick Salno smith um, hesitate to follow Jeremy's very good questions, but a slightly different comment and a, and a broader question. Um, the, the preamble about this session talks about starting with the premise that markets need not be unjust. And I think one of the things we need to worry most about is the implied assumption that most people think markets are unjust. Now, if a market is pricing a product to find out if somebody wants to pay for it, and properly incorporating the cost of inputs into that product. It seems to me a market price is one of the most valuable things we have here. And indeed, some of Lord Stern's comments about not subsidizing um, is directly relevant to that. So my question is where we've got externalities like resource use and pollution, the problem is not so much a market failure as the lack of the pricing of that input. Now, we've been talking about that in terms of carbon and perhaps pollution more generally, but as the world gets more populated, as Jeremy was saying, should we be thinking about other resource use, water is the obvious one, but there may be others, that we're also failing to price as an input? And that if we allow that to continue, even if miraculously we fix CO2, in 20 years' time, we'll be saying, damn, we missed these three other things where we've now got a real problem because we had a whole global economic environment that was failing to price the cost of these inputs. Okay, uh, so if there's no other comments from the floor, then we'll, let's just turn to the panel. And um, we have, how does business live without growth? Um, do we have too many people? And uh, should business play a role in controlling that? Um, and pa how Pamela, just should to stop you for a second. Pa 
Pamela, uh, can I just 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 uh, just what one very quick uh, addition yeah, to, okay. to your comment there? Um, I, I thought it was great because um, one of the premises that you've talked about uh, today, uh, especially uh, Lord Stern, was a uh, couple. Well, with one reference to the industrial revolution, the second one was the IT revolution, which these are big paradigm shifts that move markets and government and, and consumers and, and et cetera. So people are in the know to go towards a goal. Now, I, I can't help thinking uh, where we're dealing with today is very different. Um, I'm granted, we, we need a paradigm shift in order for us to uh, uh, meet the target of uh, sustainability for the future generations. The issue is the past two paradigm shifts were demand driven by consumers who have always been looking for what's good for me. So the factories make you know, more volumes, thereby prices go down. It's good for me. And uh, from a social, economic, and political standpoint, if uh, gas prices go down, that's good for me. I'll vote for you. So that's very natural. It's very instinctual. Um, same for IT. If I can communicate better at a cheaper cost, telephone cost, uh, long distance used to cost ten dollars now is a dollar it's great I'll buy it so these are big movements and uh, and, and you can see the, the civil and government working together now the issue with the current situation is this is really something that's for the greater good and how do you price in the greater good which is in conflict with the, what's good for me how do you deal with it how do you price it in how do you price it in such a sense that the individual the consumer won't think that hey this is more expensive, but the, gov the government or the, 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 the corporations or, or the Dow Chemical is making the money. Okay, you can tell me you've uh, returned certain goods in a quantifiable value uh, to, the, uh, you know, to the environment, but what does it mean for me? So to me, this ought to be some kind of mechanism, uh, you know, whether through education or whatnot, to deal with this in order to give this, uh, this paradigm shift a real shove. Otherwise, it's probably not going to work for, for a while. So, so thanks. OK, so we have some very specific and very broad issues to deal with. Um, if I can ask the panel to uh, you make sort of two two-minute final remarks, because uh, we're going to um, get pushed out of here by lunch. <laughs> so um, uh. let me turn to Cherie first. Um, cause um, uh, I think. Uh, in terms, I, I, in terms of sort of to, for the policies or, or the input to the CGI, I think maybe we start with ourselves, just something very simple, maybe not, not to have these bottles <laughs> around in the car. I mean, just start, you know, we start from ourselves and, and you know, maybe try to turn the aircon down a little bit <laughs> so that, uh, you know, it will save some energy for the hotel so we work in. But um, I think um, we... we um, I think I've talked about the business side. Maybe on the policy side, um, I actually thought, uh, Dr. Sukachai, I feel we should consider some kind of tax to create some uh, revenue stream that would really support some of the causes that are needed, even to support CGI for your sustainability uh, research. You know, I, I do feel that. Um, you know, maybe tax those, uh, you know, program tra trading naked shots even, you know. To the, the ta I think there should be different tax. I mean, Bill Gates has also suggested it. I think for, for those that are long-term, you know, this is about the mentality. Um, if, I think we have to reduce the short-term mentality. So maybe longer-term investments, transactions should be taxed differently from those that are just in and out that are completely, you know, I, I had breakfast with uh, Larry, sorry, uh, maybe it's just one last uh, part. Uh, I think Larry Lau was just saying that uh, global currency transaction is 1.5 trillion. You know, that, that number is, is even hard to understand. It's a thousand trillion. And uh, the actual real trade is, is only 20. So it's, it's a, uh, we live in a world where Keynes has said, you know, national capital development should not be premised upon a casino. We really have to relook at the whole system. More focus should be 
on these real sustainable issues and not on um, a casino market. That's Thank you. Dr. Subachai. Uh, there's two, two things, Pamela. Uh, first things uh, about uh, the role of the state. Alfred Marshall, uh, father of neoclassical economics, used to say about markets that they, they're just like nature. They work well when they don't have to make a jump. Markets work well when they don't have to make a jump. But for sustainability to be accepted as part of the policy strategy of countries, particularly in Asia, we have to make quite a quantum jump. And therefore, we're not saying whether markets are just or unjust. We're just saying that markets are not sufficient, not adequate to get this into, into, the, into the strategy. It needs to be led by governments together with the private sector. And so I would like to advise the Fung Institute that if they could help us, because Nick and I and we at the UN, and we're trying to work in, in a way that the awareness of this could be accepted by the public, by the constituency. So that when, when politicians have to act, they would know that in spite of the paradigm change, they are not acting in, against, the, uh, against the, uh, the will of the consumers, that, that they are well informed, better informed. This, this is much needed. Uh, the second part is the, uh, is the global role that I kept going back to. As much as we would like to look at this through the Asian lens, there is no way that this is, this is, this is, a, this is a linked effect. I mean, uh, global uh, environmental issues are just all interrelated, more so than finance and everything. So we need, we need really that Asi Asian policy makers and the rest of the world to be able to sit down together and see how much we can put real actions into the common but differentiated responsibility. You know, this has become a mantra, uh, something that we cannot actually put in the kind of policies, who is going to do what? There's a common responsibility that must be differentiated according to the capabilities of the countries. This has, this has to be really accepted by the international community and implemented. Dawson was saying about uh, what Dow Chemicals is doing seems to be a very important example. And uh, energy efficiency in particular looks to be about half of what we able to contribute, about half what we need to do in uh, cutting emissions uh, from energy sources. So that is a fundamentally important point, and it's encouraging that uh, firms like Dow Chemicals, Walmart, and others are pushing ahead uh, on that. Uh, the, use of the use of the revenues from um, carbon taxes, supporting R&D, and protecting the poorest seem to me to be uh, very high on the list of uh, priorities. Population, well, essentially, population is a combination of death rates and birth rates. You can raise death rates, or you can lower birth rates, I assume you're talking about the latter, not the, not the former, but if you want to go for the former, free, free cigarettes for the over 30s or something uh, would do the former. But if you focus on the latter, then it seems to me we do understand in large measure what affects birth rates. It's uh, uh, education for girls and women, invo involvement of girls and women in, in the uh, labor force, rising standards of living, lowering infant mortality rates, and uh, access to reproductive health care. Uh, those are things which actually, I, I take it, I hope I can take it, that most of us would regard as very important in their own right, even if you've never heard about climate change. Obviously, it's strengthened. But basically, the reason that uh, uh, population is going to go from 7 billion to 9 billion in the next 40 years is the number of women in uh, uh, childbearing age at that time, even though fertility rates are going down very rapidly across the world. So the things that I've described, I'm sure that you would share, are things that we should do, and uh, perhaps we should focus even harder, but we should have been focusing anyway on, uh, on those things. Business actually can do a lot. Employ more women, help with encouraging uh, women's education. You can make reproductive health care, you know, many firms do, available through the firm and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, markets and market failure. To, to fail to correct market failure is to distort markets. What we're talking about when we're talking about correcting market failure is 100% pro-market. Those who don't want 
uh, intervention to halt market failure are in favor of distorting markets. We should be very clear about that. Um, it does involve uh, more than, I was focusing on greenhouse gases, there's a lot more, and I think water is of uh, prime importance. And after all, climate change works. The impacts of climate change are largely through water, at storms, floods, droughts, desertification, sea level rise. It's a, a very coherent agenda looking at climate change and water at the same time. And what we're doing in the waste that we make of water in the world is absolutely criminal. And a lot of it is about not making, not getting markets involved uh, sufficiently well. The upshot is, of course, of not pricing water properly is the poorest people in the world pay the highest price for water. And that is the, the lesson that we uh, have to understand. The very last point that was made is that this industrial revolution has to be driven much more by public policy than past industrial revolution. It's a fundamentally important point. Um, that doesn't mean it won't happen or it shouldn't happen. Uh, it is something that has to be driven by public policy. Public policy has to be driven by leadership, and it has to be driven by demand from what people want. Those people who, uh, you know, like many people in this room, I've got grandchildren at uh, very young ages. This isn't some abstract future generation. It's them that we're talking about. So it is in our interest. It's very powerfully in our interest to manage climate change properly, but it's in our collective interest. It's a public good issue, which means that the demand has to come from communities as a whole. Now, I think the cheerful thing is that in large parts of the world, that demand is coming, uh, and it's also being reflected in leadership. And it has to be those two things working together if we're to create the kind of public policy we need. We get direct benefits from energy efficiency uh, without necessarily going uh, to the public good story that I've been describing. A lot of it is very attractive anyway. The combination of the IT revolution and this uh, energy revolution is actually fortuitous for the world because a lot of energy efficiency will be driven uh, by IT. But you can't get away from the basic that this one uh, has to be driven by public policy, and if public policy is to kick in, it has to be top and bottom, people demanding it, leadership giving it. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm being told to uh, sort of move you over to lunch. Um, I, I would like to just thank the panel uh, for pointing out that uh, there are many ways to get to our objective, but that uh, just for us to remember that we're actually all working in the same direction, and what we need to do is actually bring the policy closer to where the private sector is going so that we can actually work together in complementary ways. Please uh, th help me to thank the panel. Uh, Thanks a lot. I'm supposed to roll over to lunch.